Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Mr. Chair, uh, colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, it's my pleasure to talk to you uh, today on a very important issue which is related to the MDG1 target <coughs> which we are striving to attain. There is eight goals for the MDG and all of this was done in a good face but that by year 2015 that we could attain all the objectives of the eight goals. The eight goals are interlinked totally. They depend on each other. You cannot find one of them which does not relate to the other. And therefore, to succeed in one, you need to move uh, all the other eight goals. For instance, quickly, um, the one which relate to hunger and poverty will relate very much to the improvements of uh, health, uh, child uh, mort uh, mortality. It will relate to the development of global partnership as well as the environment. I mean, and then you can find relationship between all of them. But let me move, uh, because I, I will concentrate on the MDG1 in general. I will talk about the challenges which is affecting the implementation of the MDG. And from there, I will just go and focus on the dry areas as well as the Arab world or the MENA region. And from there, we will move to a couple of suggestions for the way ahead as agreed by uh, several uh, community. This uh, goal number one, has, target number one is to have the, uh, the proportion of people who has income less than $1.25 a day, and this is the indicators, next to it, the indicators. And then target 1B is to achieve full and productive employment uh, and uh, work for all, including women and young people. A target 1C will be to have the proportion of people who suffer from hunger. And the reasons for hunger mainly, uh, we can see three issues. It's a poor harvest, low yield, uh, high food prices, as well as economical crisis, low income, increasing unemployment. This three major factor is affecting um, the, the, the hunger issue. But we face challenges on this earth. This challenge is, not, uh, is related to the environment. Let me uh, just go quickly uh, to the climate change. The climate change, if we have the scenario that we have now an assured um, figure of two centigrades in a very short time, this will affect the yield and the crop production. At least in several cases, more than 30% will be affected, uh, as well as water is going to be affected. The, the areas which is... Uh, which, uh, which will, was dry, will get much more drier, and therefore we are going to face a water shortage with a very high rate. As well as uh, my, my colleague and brother, Dr. Assam, is going to talk about uh, um, the land conservation as well as the degradation. Every year we'll have about two million hectares of land which was degraded, we have lost of biodiversity, and we have increasing water capacity in brief we are living beyond the carrying capacity of Mother Earth. Therefore, the Earth is ruptured by our own actions and by our own behaviors. There is no way to, 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 to discuss now climate change is happening or not. There is compelling evidence for this. But what is clear is that all countries are going to be affected, but in particular the developing countries. And in the developing countries, it's the poor communities and the disadvantaged pe uh, people who are going to be affected more. And therefore, the MDGs, as we know, is not going to be implemented. We mentioned this is just a picture of Malawi and what's going on there. The small farmers in a great case, they don't know what to do. And next to this, if we have the temperature change, this means that the cropping pattern is going to change in the world because precipitation is going to shift. Uh, and, and therefore, what the, 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 the crops which the farmers are accustomed to plant is not going, this zone, this agroecology is not going to be fit for it. They have to move to somewhere else uh, to plant and they have to have the knowledge to plant something else in place. Of course, and we, we will have uh, plants which will tolerate to, uh, two to five centigrades more than what we have. And, and therefore, talking about the shift in the cropping system, this means that we need to work to sketch out and to map the agroecological zones in the world. Therefore, we can scale, uh, we can scale and uh, <coughs> we make an extrapolation 
and transfer and adapt the same technology somewhere else, the same genetic resources, which is genetic resources G by E, it can be used somewhere else uh, if the shift of the climate happened in certain area. And this is, uh, this is, uh, will depend on GIS and bioeconomical models. Uh, my colleague uh, Joaquin von Braun talked about uh, the bioeconomy and bio bioeconomical models yesterday. Uh, this will take us as well uh, that we will have to be careful in the future uh, for the ecological footprint. You know, we know the beef, one kilo of beef will cost about 15,000 cubic meters of water, and uh, we will go on like this. Wheat will cost less. Uh, even agro-management techniques will use energy, and therefore it will impact, um, it will impact uh, uh, temperature uh, and temperature change. Superimposed on what I'm saying, then we had the food crisis. And part of the food crisis, at least 35% uh, of it, uh, there is two scenarios, World Bank scenario and every scenario and other people, uh, but probably the crisis, 30% of it has been caused by using food for fuel, and this has a great impact, especially on the developing country and especially on the, the poor. Again, superimposed on this is a financial crisis, which still, we're still living on the tails of it. It, it didn't really go away. And again, another dimension is that the, de the developed countries, the industrial countries, is protecting their own agriculture. Therefore, the total subsidy, and this is a modest figure, is about 312. And, and again, you can add subsidies which goes to biofuel and subsidies which will go to renewable resources, uh, renewable energy resources to find an alternative, and this may go beyond uh, $350 billion a year, and this is affecting the developing countries, exactly. This sketch, I mean, the, the top part of it uh, is from every, and I'll have an another slide, but we have a good relationship between energy security risk and political security as well as food security. And all this has caused the havoc, and we know that about four years ago, we had violence in different countries, including my, Egypt, and, and uh, the, the poorest has suffered more, and still we are in the tail uh, of this. Is this going to die away? This is a projection here on, on the, the prices, uh, which will, uh, the prices of the co commodities, uh, of different commodities, which you can see this is projection is uh, for year, uh, 2000, uh, in next 20, uh, 20 years, I talk about the year 2030, uh, and then you can see uh, the increase, uh, more increase in, in, in prices is ex expected, then this is not going to go away. And we need to find ways and means. Coupled with this, we already passed, a couple of months ago, we passed the 7 billion uh, population of this earth, and we are heading for 9 billion and this is causing problem. Then one can conclude that the world is on the edge, but human being has to think and has to find uh, the light in a very dark tunnel, and this light in the dark tunnel, if you, if you don't find it, this will be the end. It's misery, desertification, and uh, the loss of human values uh, who are living on this earth. But this light comes from research, from science, from knowledge, and it varies, it has and in different fields, I'm not going to go through all these fields, but remote sensing, uh, genomics, uh, simulation models, information technology, artificial intelligence, renewable energy, and the rest of it, nanotechnology, and bioprocessors, and so on. All this intervention of science could, could give us a better day for knowledge-based uh, agriculture, or even for the model Joachim has mentioned yesterday, Joachim von Braun, which is a bio, bioeconomy, sustainable bioeconomy. And then we come to investment in agriculture. Uh, and, and as you can see that, that West Asia and North Africa, which is the, built of the, the whole built of the Arab world, plus some other countries, are spending the least with Sub-Saharan Africa. And some other areas are trying to spend more, but now it's known if you spend more in research, you get more implications on the hunger and the poverty parameter. Uh, Who is investing in agriculture? And this is a proportion out of the total OED of any country, in the States it's 5%, but surprisingly, Australia spent 16.7% six, 
of its overseas development aid uh, to agriculture. And it varies, but we need more, and I will come to this later. And this is a schematic description which come out, I was member of the board of the Millennium Ecosystem Assessment, and this is, uh, this is a schematic pathway. We'll talk about two ways. One for political stability and economical prosperity, and the other one for political and economical instability. You can choose a pass, but if you choose a pass, you choose the package of it. If you do nothing, this is what you got. You got poverty and immigration and reduce the human well-being. If you use the other pass, you, you will have improved human well-being and therefore you can really uh, move forward. Anyhow, we'll come from that uh, to, I will give two examples because I cannot, the implementation of science and a lot of issues, we can, we can talk uh, a lot about it, but I will take the genetic resources, which is the building block of any breeding program to improve the tolerance of plants to sustain the increase in temperature and other changes in the fauna and the biota, which could infect the, 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 the well-being of the plant. Then I will talk on the genetic resources very briefly. Uh, of course, the Vavilov Center, we know it for years. Gene banks are very important. It needs support. That's why the initiation of the Global Crop Diversity Fund, and we have the chair is sitting over there. This is Dr. Margaret, uh, what, what's that him? Do I know you, madam? Okay. Maggie, known as Maggie, international nomad, by the way. And uh, the gene banks has to be supported, but, but we wanted a fund to support this very noble cause, and this fund was formed uh, and is supporting the gene banks everywhere. This is a, a meeting which we have in Svalbard with the late uh, Wangari. Wangari has passed away, but she was supporting all this effort. She was on the board. But this is, this is this gene bank or the store for the future of humanity, whereby the plan is to put six million uh, accessions and genetic resources in a glacial um, uh, hill uh, in, the, in the mountain. And this is to preserve it for the future. Uh, some people will call it a Noah boat. But this is a basic issue that we have to preserve and conserve the genetic resources and take it and use it in an effective breeding program as well as using genomics and the advanced elements of genetic engineering on getting better crops to, take, to, to use less water with optimum uh, production. For the water issue, this is what we are expecting, acute water poverty in the areas of, of uh, West Asia and North Africa, and especially in this part of the Arab world. Jordan already is 150. Uh, cu uh, 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 cubic meter per person per year. Uh, water stress uh, spot, uh, hot spots are spreading and um, there is, of course, um, there is extreme and, and Egypt is one of those uh, which is mentioned in the extreme. Then water management under scarcity, business as usual we cannot do, uh, therefore we need to move uh, forward and have optimization of water use. You cannot do this without knowledge, without science, and therefore, you have to apply a lot of means. Improve genetic resources, which will take less water and give you more, uh, better yield and better quality, as well as you have to have agro-management technique which minimize the use of water. Uh, uh, the average in North America is 16,000 cubic meter uh, of water per person per year, but if you look at Jordan 170, uh, Central West Asia, North Africa, where the rest of the Arab world exists is 2,000. Uh, Egypt now is heading for 800, and we are getting close to the 500 uh, cubic meter per person per year, and this is acute water poverty, therefore we are not far away. Um, then a lot of agro-management techniques, like the gated pipes can be used, uh, raised bed, uh, maybe uh, our friend uh, Asim is going to talk about these elements. Modern irrigation system as well has to be used, even the most intensive and sophisticated system like the nutrient film techniques and the, the, the hydroponics yeah. uh, could be used uh, with, with, uh, with high cash return as well as intensive labor. It could help uh, in different parts. I would like to move very quickly to the poverty measurements because this is a puzzle. Uh, a poverty measurement in, in the MDG, it was 1.25 of a dollar, but now we, Lot of, the trend is to look at the two 
uh, dollar a day as well, which is very uh, important. And then, uh, because uh, there is, uh, there is uh, uh, people go up to two dollar a day, and then with changes in the elements and the policy in the country, they may go back again to one dollar or even less. And therefore, you have to cover this group of people if you would like to have a remedy uh, for them. This is the overall MDG um, uh, progress uh, report, which is have indicators in front of you. I took Africa and Central Asia to show you, and you have here that the red is on target, some progress, and uh, off target is the red, and on target is the green. And you can see uh, one can manipulate this electronically, um, but I'm not connected to the internet. I hope I am, but I'm, I'm not quite sure. Uh, anyhow, this will take time. This is just to show you this. But if we look at the proportion of people who are undernourished as well, you can see in this map the spread which is happening uh, in different countries. And uh, of course, uh, in, the, in the Arab world, as well as in West Asia, North Africa, and MENA, in Latin America, and in uh, India, uh, things is not really very satisfactory. Regional uh, uh, progress uh, chart, and this chart uh, has targets for the 2015, but this is the latest data. Uh, the household um, figures, which is there, you cannot really rely on it beyond 2010, although this publication is 2011, but stop there. Therefore, the overall picture is not really very satisfactory, and we need to do something about it. One other issue which we have to tackle is the debt relief. Several meetings internationally was for the debt relief, because this will help the least developing countries and the countries in the developing world to move forward. But still, there is big problems, and things is not moving as uh, we wish. Because even if you have a debt relief, and you don't have in-house policies and institutions, and human resources which is, are empowered in the country, there is no hope. They will go again to do the same. And this is not an answer. Let me just focus a little bit on the Arab countries, the Mediterranean Arab countries, um, which is the countries which is stated here, including occupied Palestine territory. They, they will total 250 million by year 2025. And therefore, a lot needed to be done um, in different aspects, and if you look at <coughs> the population uh, be, be, below the three poverty line in the Middle East and North Africa, you can see clearly that um, things is not, although things is improving, but it's improving slowly, and this is not reflected in the, um, under, uh, the nutrition and people who are under, uh, uh, under severe uh, hunger, which is increasing in certain countries, including Egypt. One other element is the rural population. The rural population is increasing in these countries, and uh, the average uh, in the Arab world is 40% of the people are living in the rural areas and working there, uh, and, and therefore, out of this, 40% uh, is a really very big number, and uh, the economically active population is around 20% so far. But if we look at employment and migration issue, I would like you just to focus on the first statement on the right-hand side. For instance, we need on the, in the region, we need about 15 million new jobs uh, by year 2000, between year 2010 to the year 2020, 50% of this figure will be in Egypt only. Then you need to create new jobs. If you don't create new jobs, you will go down rather than sustaining even yourself. And therefore, that's a big challenge which we need to take, and we need uh, to see how this could be done effectively. Women in agriculture, and this is the picture um, uh, in 2010 uh, in different countries uh, in the Arab world. Um, and women play a major role in agriculture, but it's not usually empowered from a sense of institutionally empowered. It's, it's, uh, it's by the, so, uh, the social behavior in the villages that she take tasks and she do it silently, but she need more empowerment in these rural areas. The food insecurity is great. This is the argument rate balance in the Arab world and it's uh, uh, negative uh, all the time. This very interesting slide uh, of CM uh, uh, for centers has developed and uh, this is look like a balloon 
and you can move up and down according uh, to the, if you are exporter or you are importer, and this is the serial issue, which is, uh, it's net importers. The Arab world is net importer of major cereals, and this is, of course, impose a lot of pressure in the economy. And as you can see here, this is cereal dependency, um, uh, and it's, it's really very high. For instance, the uh, consumption uh, of bread and wheat consumption in Tunisia, 478 uh, uh, pound uh, per year. And then we have, if you have the US 177, in Egypt 409. And of course, this is very high figures. Again, to end up this way, what I am saying here that there is a complexity in the MENA region, in the Middle East. You have population growth, you have rule of a push, you have economical stagnation, you have education gap, you have environmental degradation, no investment, urbanization, which is taking encroachment on the arable land to, uh, to, uh, uh, to urbanization, take agricultural land to uh, rural poverty, low water productivity, etc. The demographic uh, dynamics uh, we mentioned before, but just it's imposed a lot uh, of thinking that you need to think ahead because you don't know what to do. I'll just give just quick examples, there are several regional organizations and international, including SAM. There is ICARDA, the International Center for Agricultural Research in the Dry Areas. There is the Arab Organization for Agriculture. But this is on the regional level, which belongs to the Arab League. Uh, SIAM is working as well uh, to find a way on this. SIAM has been founded by the Council of Europe in 1962. It has uh, four centers spreading in Europe. And in the last five years only, they had graduated 1,915 uh, 1, uh, master degrees as well, so scholarship about 1,300, specialized education more than 5,000 and scholarship. And therefore it worked on the education and support of research, but doesn't work in a vacuum. It worked with international center as well as it worked with, with other uh, colleagues. Um, the, the, the situation there is that you need to work with other countries in Europe and therefore the issue of trade, water sustainability, education, scientific cooperation, innovation, and industrial development, agricultural <coughs> rural areas, and employment has to be done jointly and we have to pull the means as well as mobilize all actors in the private sector and the local uh, community as well as work together on both sides of the Mediterranean to see the way uh, forward. But at the end of the day, we are saying from the beginning, we are striving uh, towards success. There is examples of success in Africa. Tanzania is moving fast. There is a lot of development in, in Tanzania, which is positive. <laughs> uh, food poverty in Tanzania has fallen 11% between 2001 and 2017. There is as well uh, good, good success stories in Niger Nigeria and Bangladesh, but the overall uh, hope and aspiration of the CADR the, uh, for the African uh, de development was not uh, fulfilled. Uh, th there was an agreement that 10% of the GDP will be spent on agriculture uh, investment. This is not happening, and therefore this is affecting tremendously uh, the, the, the way uh, forward. The, 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 the key challenges will be the insufficient aid for agriculture, uh, uh, failing to meet aid effectiveness and poorly, the aid even poorly coordinated between the donors, insufficient spending, Africa fa failure uh, to meet the spending commitments, failure to spend more. Uh, there is an issue which is very important. Without the small uh, holder in agriculture, we can lose the whole battle. Uh, therefore, we need to support uh, the, the small holder uh, in every way uh, by credit uh, as well as uh, by supporting research, increase uh, re research spending from 5 billion to 10 billion by year 2013. Uh, and, and this could uh, at least take 282 million people out of poverty. This assessment is every assessment. Ensure farmers that they have much great access to key input like seeds, um, water uh, harvesting, land, organic fertilizers, extra. But the solutions, the rescue pack package, will depend. This is the summation of all the meetings, summits, and, the, and fair work, and the MDG High Committee, and I was for the, uh, with, with the high panel of the 
uh, MDG in FAO for about seven years, and we were assessing this, but this is a conclusion. Massively increased global spending on food security by at least 40 billion per year. Development of national MDG one rescue plan. A lot of countries doesn't have a plan which have targets and have indicators of how to assess these targets. Uh, shift agricultural spending towards the service which supports smallholder agriculture and the rural poor. This is a way forward and with this complicated, this is Joaquin von Braun, uh, I think he produced this about four years or something or three years. With, 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 with this um, connections of, of the financial economical stability with political security and food security, we need to wake up and to see if we can move forward and have better future. We need to focus on human resources as well as water resources and land resources, but this cannot happen without science intervention, which is translated to technology, with enabling legislation as well as policy and institutions, which will be in place. By going forward to 9 billion uh, people by year 2040 to 2050, we can see very clearly that um, we, we will have uh, 7 out of 10 people by year 2050 will be in low income food deficit conditions. Is this what we would like to see? It will be a catastrophe if this will happen. Therefore, we need a new model uh, for prosperity which will deliver growth and prosperity to all. And therefore, we need to change the mindset of the politicians. The politicians go and meet in summits after summits. But we need this to be translated. We don't want Rio meeting, which will come in June, Rio plus 20, which will come in June, to be another failure for the commitment, as well as the G8 has to take a very serious uh, decision uh, for the future. And therefore, we can see better future for all of us. We, have, we wish that this could happen, and we wish that this mother and her child will have a good environment uh, for them to contribute and to fulfill their human degree of happiness. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Adel Beltagi. Our, uh, if we will have the question and answer at the end of this session. Uh, it's my honor to uh, present to you uh, Dr. Norman Opoff. Uh, Dr. Opoff is a professor at Cornell International Institute for Food, Agriculture, and Development, Cornell University. Uh, he is currently director of the Cornell Institute for Public Affairs, having previously served for 15 years as director of the Cornell International Institute for Food. For the time being, that's enough. Also, he has a lot, a very long uh, CV. I could go on and on in it. So uh, please welcome Dr. Opa. Thank, thank you, Professor Solomon. And I thank my friend, uh, Adil El Beltagi for giving you the overview of what our challenges to meet Millennium, Millennium Development Goal number one. I'm going to consider, as the title says, an agroecological alternative route. Uh, we've made great progress with the previous methodologies. Uh, the MDG challenge to radically reduce and then end hunger and poverty is daunting. The central strategy for agricultural improvement has been based on the successes of the Green Revolution. And we did achieve dramatic increases in cereal grain productivity in the 60s, 70s, and 1980s. But the acceleration in food production achieved with the Green Revolution strategies has ended as the strategy itself is encountering diminishing returns. Almost all phenomena have the problem of diminishing returns. And I think we may see this with our current research strategy. World per capita cereal production peaked in 1984. And total cereal production has been relatively stagnant uh, since really the mid-90s. We have ups and downs, but in fact, we've made very little progress in the recent decades. So the question is, where do we go from here? Do we do more of the same? Proponents of biotechnology think that with the new tools of molecular biology, we can break out of the current stagnation, and they may be right. 
But I would like to suggest that we consider an alternative route as well, which I would characterize generally as agroecological strategy. These two can proceed concurrently. Biotechnological developments, in fact, may make some very useful contributions to agroecological practices. But it will need to understand more about the nature of crop production and do what I call rebiologizing agriculture. Plants should be understood not as a kind of carbon-based machine that we design and fuel with our resources, but rather should be understood as organisms, or not as organisms, but as systems. And we heard some of this in yesterday's presentation on the way in which both animals and plants are really systems of plant or animal and uncountable numbers of microorganisms. So we are fully interdependent with and dependent on the world of microorganisms, the microbiome, as we were told yesterday. So animals and plants both need to have a new paradigm, a new ontological understanding of what is the reality we're working with in agriculture. And this is the take-home message I hope you will get from my presentation, as I think you also got it yesterday <coughs> from yesterday's uh, presentation. I don't think we're going to achieve Millennium Development Goal number one if we don't get a different paradigm different understanding of the nature of the reality that we're dealing with. The Green Revolution was based on two principal strategies. The first, to make improvements in crop varieties, better genotypes, which would be selected, selected to be responsive to our external inputs, and then to increase our external inputs, particularly inorganic fertilizers, but also water and the use of agrochemical protection, which control the pests and diseases. But it turns out that these pests and diseases are themselves increased by the use of fertilizers and agrochemicals. If any of you have not read the book by Francis Chabousseau, a French scientist, uh, the title in English is Healthy Plants, published 2004. I am amazed that so few agriculturalists even know of this work by a very senior INRA researcher uh, who unfortunately died shortly after he wrote the book in 1985. It is still relevant today. Let me ask a question, what if what if we can improve our food production without the use of new varieties and without heavy use of fertilizer? I pose that as a question. And also with less requirement of water in the case of irrigated rice production and with more resistance to biotic stresses, pests and disease uh, attacks and loss, and more resistance to abiotic stresses, drought, storm damage, extreme temperatures and so forth, Plus, in the case of rice, higher milling output per bushel of paddy rice, more kilograms of edible polished rice as well. What if we could do that? These are the results we're seeing with something called the System of Rice Intensification, SRI for short, which was developed in Madagascar in the early 80s, and since 2000 has been spreading in Asia, with some successes also in Africa and Middle East and Latin America. What we do is by changing the management of the plants, the soil, the water, and the nutrients, we get more productive phenotypes from practically all the genotypes we've used so far, reflecting this characteristic which all you in plant breeding will know. The phenotype is a function of the genetic inheritance of the environment and of the interaction between genetic potential and environmental circumstances. This, as I'm going to suggest, is very much where the role of microbes comes in. This is a picture from Nepal of a rice plant grown from a single seed. This is the kind of genetic potential which the rice plant has if given the solar energy, the water, the space, the soil nutrients, and so forth. This is a picture from Cuba, where these two plants are the same genotype, the same variety, same age. They started in the same nursery, but the one on the right was taken out as a tiny seedling, nine days old, transplanted not in a clump, but individually, not in rows, but in squares even. So we cut the plant population by 80%, even 90%, and get a very different phenotype when all these practices are done together. This is a picture from the Rice Research Center in Basra, or near Najaf, excuse me, in Iraq, where they try different varieties with SRI management on the left, conventional management, older seedlings, close spacing, organic fertilizer, flooding on the right. You just see the difference in the phenotype, which can be drawn out of the genotype for variety after variety. 
This is a rice plant which my wife and I were given by Indonesian farmers, which has 223 tillers from one seed. So what I want to emphasize is what the potential is. Here's a report from uh, Aceh in Indonesia, where the NGO Caritas introduced SRI methods after the tsunami there. And they report in their newsletter fourfold increase in production. Farmers who got two tons per hectare before on the same soil, same varieties, same skills, not the same skills, new skills, new knowledge, able to get 8.5 ton average yield with that existing genotype. Here's a report from Bhutan, which you know is in the Himalayas, where an extension agent sent this report in. Standard practice, 3.6 tons per hectare. If you use SRI, small seedlings, wide spacing, but random, without the same kind of management, six tons. If you did 25 by 25 spacing, only 16 plants per square meter, 9.5, when you did 30 by 30, about 10, 10, point, 10 tons. In Bhutan, again, a place where you don't think of getting very high yields. This is a picture in Afghanistan where the Aga Khan Foundation is introducing SRI up in Baglan province. There they are planting 13 day old seedlings, about 30 by 30 spacing under very unusual, difficult conditions. Here's the field at 30 days. And here's the kind of difference in phenotype that we see. On the left is SRI plant, on the right is normal plant, same variety. And these are the results, six farmers, 10.1 versus 5.4, 42 farmers, 9.3 versus 5.6. Interestingly, the second year farmers, just six of them, averaged 13.3, whereas the new farmers were 8.7. Skill becomes an important factor, which is really important for farmers when they have very little land and water resources. 2011 up to 106 farmers, again a 10.1 ton yield. Remarkable improvements using the same resources that farmers already have. This is in Mali, Timbuktu, and you see the rice nursery, <laughs> not the kind you'd have here in Egypt, of course. Uh, there they are transplanting, and this is showing in the phenotype difference, where the first time one farmer tried these methods in Timbuktu, 8.98 tons, very good. Uh, with the support of the Better You Foundation, Jim Carrey's foundation, next year we had 12 villages, five farmers each village participating, side-by-side -side trials, same farmers, same soil, same climate. They averaged 9.1 versus 5.49. Uh, next year, then 130. And this is with less water. So they calculated 32% reduction in water inputs. The SRI system, just in very brief, we transplant very young seedlings, using the growth potential that's greater in the younger seedlings compared to older. We avoid trauma to the roots, treat them very carefully, very preciously. Wide spacing, one plant per hill in a square pattern so the plants are exposed to the sun and the air circulation fully. Keep the soil moist, intermittently dry, but not flooded, not saturated, not hypoxic, so the roots don't die back. Then we actively air the soil as much as possible with a mechanical weeder, you can, as Amir will say, with conservation agriculture, probably get rid of the weeder and let the earthworms do that job for you. That's where we like to be. But at the moment, usually you have to do active oils, soil aeration, and then enhance the organic matter as much as possible. The two things we get then are very large functioning root systems. You saw that picture from Cuba. And what you can't see then is the abundance and diversity of soil biota, though we have some data on that. This is a picture from Sri Lanka where you have the same variety, same soil, same climate, and the same drought. On the left was conventionally grown rice. The water stopped for three weeks, and you see it turning yellow now, suffering. On the right is the same variety, but SRI management with three weeks of drought, no effect. This is from just north of Hanoi, a woman showing an SRI plant on the left and a normal plant, same variety, on the right after a typhoon had passed over. And you see what happened to the normal crop, very badly lodged. On the right, not a single plant was blown over by the wind and the rain. This I was given by a farmer last summer in East Java. The third farmer on the right, her neighbor is using a modern variety fertilizer, all the package. And she's doing organic SRI with a traditional variety. And this, these fields were hit by both brown plant hopper attack, that's why you see the color on the left, and also typhoon. <laughs> and you see the neighbor got virtually no harvest. 
she got an eight ton average yield with a traditional variety uh, and you can see the, the vigor of that crop. Farmers are now taking these ideas into other crops. This is a report by Reuters from Bihar State of India, SWI, System of Wheat Intensification. This woman had almost a tripling of yield and the story tells how her family's circumstances had been transformed by this. This is finger mill from the state of Jharkhand, India. On the right is a traditional variety, normal management. In the middle is improved variety with normal management. And you see, genes make a difference. But when the improved variety is used with the management practices, they call it SFMI, finger millet intensification, you see the very different expression of that genetic potential. Uh, in India, we're working with both WWF, Worldwide Fund for Nature, and ICRASAT on what's now called S SI, which is application of these ideas to sugar cane. These are things now which I just put together for this. We're seeing some remarkable yields coming for a variety of crops when these ideas are used. Uh, rice, there was recently a new world record production of 22.4 tons per hectare in the state of Bihar, Nalanda district, Darvishpura village, measured by the local agricultural technicians, now accepted by ICAR, International Council, Indian House of Agricultural Research, as the 22.4 ton yield, almost 10 times the state's average. And uh, the previous record was 19 tons with hybrid rice. Actually, this first one I say is with hybrid rice. It's a Bayer hybrid RE 6444. So those of you who are working in genetic improvement, be very satisfied. But the fact is you can also get, there were, there were four other farmers who got 18 and 19 ton yields with a Syngenta hybrid, I should say, also in that same village. Something's going on in those soils. In wheat, we had a report just a month ago or less, 12.6 ton yield on farmer's field in Bihar. Mustard, which usually is about one ton, 4.92, measured by the Bihar State Department of Agriculture Technicians. Teff in Ethiopia, some may know Dr. Tariki Burhe, who was trained at Kansas State University, did his postdoc with Norman Borlaug at CIMIT, who is now doing STI, system of Teff intensification. He sent me an email just about six weeks ago saying they are up to 6.2 ton yield with Teff where normally it's about one ton in Ethiopia. And the potato yield is incredible. This was reported about two months ago in Bihar State. And again, the previous record is 45 tons per hectare in Holland for the world. This farmer had a 72.9 ton yield. There's pictures I could show you of the chief minister of Bihar showing one kilogram weight potatoes. Something's going on which we don't really fully understand in terms of getting uh, pheno phenotypic expression. So what if crop plant systems are benefiting from these changes of the growing environment above and below ground if it's promoted by symbiotic endophytic microbes? There's a mouthful. Uh, this is what I'm going to focus on. Both bacteria and fungi were getting increasing evidence to make a huge impact on the phenotypic expression of plants not only in the rhizosphere and the root zone, which we know about, but also now in the leaves and the canopy and even the seeds. This is some research published in uh, uh, the Journal of Applied Environmental Microbiology, research done by the, in the China Academy of Biology, uh, looking with five different strains of rhizobia, where they inoculated the soil, which had been previously sterilized. The control is the unoccupied, <laughs> dead, un, you know, unliving soil. Total plant root, shoot, shoot dry weight, net rate of photosynthesis, water utilization efficiency, and the grain yield, all significantly higher simply by having the same soil but with microbes in the soil, which they showed migrate up the roots and stem into the <coughs> phylosphere, into the leaves. So they inhabit the leaves and the sheaths of the plants. Tremendous impact there. And Dr. Chi and his colleagues have published more recently an article in Proteomics Journal where they looked at what is the gene impact on gene expression of having soil rhizobia in the canopy compared to having no such infection, infestation, inhabitation of the canopy by these soil biota. And in particular, they found that there were protein expression for proteins useful in photosynthesis in the leaves and the canopy of plants which were infected by 
Cyanarhizobium melolotti 1021, which is the microbe they were working with there. That same organism in the roots of the plant upregulates expression of genes that are important for protein production that protects against pathogens. So we're starting to understand better this intimacy between the plants and the microorganisms. This is research done by uh, scientists, most associated with the U.S. Geological Survey, published in the Journal of Communicative Integrative Biology, where they inoculated the seeds of rice with a fungus, Fusarium clomorum. Now, most agronomists hate funguses. <laughs> Fusarium clomorum is one of the bad guys. But it turns out if you sterilize the seeds and then inoculate some seeds with Fusarium and others not, you get five times more root growth in those first five days in a root shoot comparison. So one is where there's equal roots and equal, equal roots and shoots. The line above is because the roots are growing that much faster than the shoot in those early days. Here's a picture showing at one day, two day, or a start, germination, two days, four days, eight days, the different way in which the roots are growing and the root hairs begin two days earlier in the inoculated seeds compared to those without the fungal inoculation. I'm almost through. This is work done by an Indian Council of Agriculture Research uh, scientist, Dr. Thakur, who invited me to join him at the Water Management Center in Bhubaneswar, published in Journal of Experimental Agriculture. He found that plants which had been managed with SRI methods were double the efficiency of water use, double the photosynthesis per unit of water transpired in these plants. So what we're seeing is very different phenotypes elicited, first of all, by the management practice, but we think now increasingly mediated or in some sense caused by the role of micronutrients, uh, microorganisms, excuse me, also micronutrients. Another subject I'll get into another time, but not a lot of time. My last slide. This experience and these results do not argue against making further genetic improvements or against use of external inputs. This is not a zero-sum situation. But I will suggest that most of the work we've seen in the biotechnology has really paid little attention to the symbiotic relationship between plants and microorganisms, treating plants more like machines. We designed them, redesigned them. The genomes have been manipulated, and it's the gene which causes this. Well, as we heard yesterday, it's that interaction of the genetic potential with the environment, and the big part of the environment, we think, is the microorganisms. It suggests that to meet the micro Millennium Development Goal number one, we can make great progress right away at low cost, saving water and buffering against climate change by giving more attention to crop management, and especially nurturing of roots and the nurturing of soil biota, which I care as saying rebiologizing agriculture. Not making it industrial activity, but rather capitalizing upon the, the, the potentials that are already in not just the plants, but in their symbionts, uh, symbiotic endophytes, or whatever you want to use. So thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much, Mr. Dr. Popov, for being on time. And uh, our next speaker is Dr. Amir Kassam. Uh, Amir is a visiting professor at the School of Agriculture, Policy, and Development. University of Reading. He presents a postgraduate course entitled Rethinking Agriculture, Implementing Solutions. So we are expecting to get some solution from Amir uh, mm -hmm. this morning as well. Uh, Amir, he was awarded an OPE in the Queen Owners List in 2005. He also is an advisor in sustainable agriculture intensification with the FAO in Rome. He is a moderator of the FAO hosted global platform for conservation agriculture community of practices. So please welcome Dr. Amir. Good, good morning, everyone. Um, I um, uh, We'll be presenting uh, um, the, not the roadmap, but the journey which is already taking place on a roadmap, which was which has been chalked out some time ago. 
It is not known by everybody. It's not really fully known by the, our august research community, especially international research community. Uh, but that roadmap, the alternative roadmap, does exist. It's been going on, and it is getting stronger and stronger. It's the roadmap of conservation agriculture, the roadmap of paradigm change. I think in the future it will be looked back upon as a paradigm change roadmap, probably as big as the flat earth versus the round earth, mm -hmm. the sun going around the earth, or the earth going around the, the sun, or whether we need monarchy or we don't. I think that that is the kind of paradigm shift we're talking about, uh, and that's what I'm going to talk about. Um, I work with FAO uh, with a colleague, uh, Theo Fiedrich, who is a global coordinator in FAO um, on conservation agriculture. I'll uh, say something about sustainable crop production intensification. The word sustainable, uh, often uh, I hear is a dirty word. We don't understand it. I think we do understand it. We just don't want to understand it sometimes. Uh, it will focus on soil health, ecosystem functions, and, and productivity. Uh, we'll, I will talk about conservation agriculture, concept impact, and wider picture, and, and we'll look at the history and development uh, of the global uptake of, of conservation agriculture, and I'll draw. And there are some issues around CA adoption and scaling, like they are with any, any, uh, uh, any uh, uh, uptake of technology or practice, and, and we'll draw some conclusion. Um, Sustainable crop production intensification is a term which is now getting popular. Uh, the UK Foresight Report uses, used it. But if in FAO, for 10 years, we've been working uh, on, on this issue of what is sustainable and what is sustainable intensification and what makes it work. And finally, in the last five years, the work at FAO led to uh, uh, a launch, launching off of a concept um, called Save and Grow. This was launched by the DG last year. And, and this FAO felt sufficiently confident enough to call it the new paradigm of agriculture. Some of you, of course, may have uh, um, known FAO, and of course, uh, doesn't, it doesn't carry a very high reputation. But this, this time, it did put its snake out and said that we do have something different here and that we are, we, we, we are calling it a new paradigm of, of agriculture. And essentially, essentially, that they think that now if we want sustainability, then productivity enhancement must be accompanied by ecosystem services. The current agriculture, the current dominant agriculture everywhere, whether it's in, in England or Europe uh, or America or Canada, Egypt or Tanzania, the current agriculture which we are pushing cannot deliver ecosystem services. There is a fundamental flaw in what we do with our agricultural production system. And that flaw has a deep environmental footprint which continues to operate at a higher rate than the recovery capacity of the land resource base or the ecosystem. And this book basically uh, opens up, unpacks that, that, uh, that concept of integrated productivity enhancement with ecosystem services. Norman m talked about uh, the, 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 the so-called so -called green revolution paradigm has been based, and this is, I, it's not CG which discovered the green revolution. There have been green revolutions several times over uh, but, and, and, and the so-called Green Revolution, um, uh, which we have been living through, was handed down, um, and most of us were trained in it by teachers who themselves received it from others. And there are underlying assumptions which nobody uh, has challenged. Things like, for example, fixing the agronomy. Fix the agronomy and get the genetics to work, and we have wide adaptability. And that's the philosophy CG has been living on. Wide adaptability, public goods uh, 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 for wide, wide adaptation. But, but it comes at a cost. So we've fixed our agronomy. We've continued to disturb the soil system. Uh, we 
believe all the time that somehow we need modern varieties. You go into a village and say, well, the first thing you will say, we want to start development here, we need modern varieties. And this is so typical of a scientist who doesn't know the, f the village, doesn't even know what exists, but he, will, he has been told, like a parrot, to say you will need new varieties and you will need fertilizer, you will need microfinance, and you better get a tractor with a big plow, or at least aspire for, to the, towards that. Now that is the paradigm we've been living with for the last 40 years. And it has served a purpose in certain, certain places. But it is now out of, it is running out, it is, its fitness for use is now basically uh, being, uh, is, 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 is running out. We now know that something is not quite right. It leads to, the downside has been the pollution, reduced efficiency, loss of soil health, and ecosystem services, soil erosion, massive soil erosion even in Europe now, wind erosion as well. Last April, uh, an 81 car pileup in northern Germany, straight out of plowed field, minimum tillage, creating dust in the topsoil, taking off in a dry weather, and basically blinding drivers, and seven people were killed. This is northern Europe, moist northern Europe. Erosion has been accepted as unavoidable side effect. On the other hand, the sustainable intensification paradigm, which is the alternate paradigm, um, basically seeks to integrate, integrate modern science with understanding, better understanding of natural processes to boost production and environmental services. This is what we call, we seem to be calling agroecological approach, whereas the other one is the interventionist approach, which is basically uh, intervene without really understanding what are the consequences of intervention? Uh, and I'm sorry that I, I say that because I was also hooked up into that. I was wired up into that system as well. Um, and, and this agroecological approach is really basically to avoid waste and use input as the system can take it and not sort of make it addictive and, 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 and uh, overfeed it. But the current dominant paradigm essentially if we had to describe it, it is a low carbon farming paradigm of intensive tillage, disrupting, constantly disrupting and debilitating many of the important soil mediated ecosystem functions. They don't even enter into the picture uh, in, in, in many of the research uh, programs. Um, and leaving the soil and the landscape exposed, unprotected and starved of organic matter. You want microbiomes in the soil to work, they need organic matter, just as you and I do, to eat, to function. Energy, we need, we need that from, from, uh, from what we eat. So do, the, so do they. And we have a paradigm today which starves the soil of organic matter, and that is basically, at the moment, the root cause of our degradation, which is loss in soil health, agrobiodiversity, soil structure, compaction, runoff erosion, and eventually, of course, eventually, weeds, pest, pathogen, they all turn up. Why not? Why shouldn't they? And this then further is exacerbated by applying excessive mineral fertilizer to try and prop it up, and seeds in fixed agronomy onto farmland that has been losing its ability to respond to inputs due to degradation and reducing or doing away with crop diversity. The market will decide. Of course, market will decide but market will decide certain things, but not everything. The custodian nature of, of farming is not decided by the market. It is decided by human values. It is decided by nurturing uh, uh, responsibility uh, rather than responding always just to, to the market. So we have reduced or doing away with crop diversity and rotation, which were largely in place until, about, uh, until around the time of World War II. We then had surplus explosives which were nitrates, and they certainly had to be found a new home, and agriculture was the new home. We had big motors by that time. Big tanks had to, had to have big motors. So those big motors also went and built big tractors. We, we have uh, something changed after the uh, Second World War, and, and I'm afraid a number of things in the agricultural sector uh, uh, happened which we have accepted as norm. And our teachers 
were indoctrinated with that, and they taught, uh, taught uh, us, and we are supposed to continue with that philosophy. In the meantime, the situation now is leading to further problems of increased threats from pest diseases and weeds, and we are applying even more pesticides and herbicides. So there are large negative externalities which are now being accepted even in Europe. Even in Europe. The DEFRA's report on food security starts with soil, major soil threats, loss in organic matter, compaction, erosion. This is uh, DEFRA in, in the UK. So we are now, uh, and this is everywhere, and including, including, it, this is, this is, and uh, this is happening everywhere, and yet, I would say, by and large, our research system continues to promote and even impose on farmers everywhere, more or less out of ignorance and closed-mindedness, this so-called the Green Revolution paradigm. But the good news is that, that farmers themselves, especially about 40 years ago, started their own research, and they got going. And conservation agriculture is a story which has been driven more by farmers and civil society than by scientists. This, the book which has most impressed me recently is this book called Dirt by David Montgomery. There lies the, 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 the explanation of the root cause, the fundamental weakness in our current production system. I'm focusing on production system because that's where the engine is. So we have all, th all the things which we want, market access, value chain, input supply, partnership, gender, you can go and, but you know, all that is being built around an engine which is now producing, uh, operating very inefficiently. And this book basically says that essentially throughout the world, for several thousands of years, what has happened is that he can show that in general, because of soil disturbance and soil tillage, whether it is by hoe or animal drone implement, an art or a small chisel plow or whatever, or, or, a, or a moldboard plow, the rate of soil degradation and erosion tends to be generally higher than the natural soil formation. So, it is basically a downward slide. The rate of slide might differ, but essentially what we've got now, we can basically say that it is not a sustainable system. We may be able to prop it up, but it becomes expensive, and there is the negative externality which becomes even more expensive, ex uh, expensive to, 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 uh, to clean up. So this is the book which I would recommend to everybody to read it. And, 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 and understand what is actually not quite right with our, uh, our uh, production system. Unfortunately, uh, research, uh, research communities haven't actually fully uh, endorsed this, uh, uh, appreciated it, and, and they have not really, uh, so conservation agriculture is not fully benefiting from the research community. The, the research funding is going into, oh, we want more research, we want more research, we're starving, we want more research. Fine, yeah, but again, what will you do with more money? What about the money you get now? Why don't you put that into some system which we know are working and remove the flaws uh, in, this, in the current system? This is uh, uh, the promised land, actually. This is uh, from Mount Nebo. I stood there uh, and w looked at it. And this is where uh, uh, Nabi, Nabi Musa was told, take your people, go. Now, if he was told today, I think he would probably say, are you out of your mind? <laughs> but this is, this is what we are creating. This is what we are creating in the world in many, many places. And, and, and this is what is doing it. Our conventional, regular tillage, clean seeded, exposed uh, production system, which removes cover, disrupts the pores, disrupts the, uh, disrupt, destroys the, the structure, uh, gets rid of the organic matter and with it the biodiversity and we have basically a death and destruction in the soil and we basically have a whole research philosophy around that uh, and, and, and development philosophy or, or what to do about it. The consequences are, are in these pictures. We get erosion, we get carbon dioxide taking off which is money these days, we got dust storms, 
This picture of Iguazu Falls in Brazil was taken in the 70s. This could be T, a river, you know, Yellow River. This is this is a river. Tiber in Rome goes like this, even today. And you, nobody bothers. Why should a river look like this in Europe? But this is Brazil. We can we can we can accept that. Oh, that's Brazil. But this was in the 70s. Today is this. It's white water. And they've done it by not asking the research community for answers. The farmers just done it themselves. They switched over to zero disturbance production system and stopped moving the soil. This is Sorensen, uh, uh, Sorensen's work that every time, this is the, the water in that, in that Aitapu Dam, which is one of the largest dams in the world, that every time the, 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 the nitrate level shot up, it, it coincided with the period of soil preparation. Same thing with phosphor, phosphorus. This is a, an interesting picture. I've got several of these. This is a farm in Germany. It receives single farm payment within the European Common Agriculture Policy Pillar 1, with no questions asked. This is a lovely landscape. But this... Um, this uh, the field has been dumping stuff in that reservoir, obviously, for years. But it's not just, not just uh, the, uh, the soil. But with soils go microorganisms, toxic chemicals, fertilizer, everything is going in there. But he's collecting his money. Just want you to note that how weak our understanding is about management, custodian management of our agricultural resources, even in Europe. That, that uh, uh, you know, it, it's, it's, uh, it's w quite worrying. But this is going to change now in the new cup, which is going to come into, 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 into being uh, soon. This will begin to change. The pa payments are going to be linked to practices, environmentally beneficial practices as well. So this is at the heart of our understanding of what agriculture, modern agriculture, should become. We aspire to this. This is Rothamsted International Research has this in, 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 in the, in the co inside the cover page in a publication, Fo Soil Security for England, 2030. And that is the picture, that's the image. This is leaf. Leaf is linking environment and, and, and farming. It certifies, it certifies farming standards in, in the UK. The cover page is that picture over there on the right. How on earth is that soil going to stay there? Can somebody tell me here in this room? And on the left there is a lovely, lovely reversible plow. Mm -hmm. And this is what we are selling, promoting as modern mm -hmm. agriculture everywhere. In Africa, I see John Deere, big, big posters, you know, and maybe soon it will say, buy one and we'll get you, give you s uh, two free. <laughs> and this is, this is what's happening underneath. This is underneath that, that uh, um, and, and, sorry, yeah, and then more underneath. And when on the, on, the, on the right, when it rains, it floods. Under the conservation agriculture, which I'm just going to come, come to, there is no flooding. So consequence of uh, tillage-based <laughs> agriculture, loss of organic matter, water losses, runoff, lo loss of time, seed fertilizer, less capacity to capture and slow release water and nutrient, less efficiency of mineral fertilizer, loss of bio biodiversity. Anything you can think of which we talk about and worry about but don't understand why it is happening or if we know we don't seem to be caring enough to stop it and, w and, and, and challenge that something might be, do we're doing something which, which might not be right. And finally, we now have higher, and we have poor adaptability to climate change and mitigation because our current agriculture is a major emitter. Conservation agriculture is a mitigator. So we have higher production costs, lower farm productivity and profit, degraded land and ecosystem service. M many of you might have seen this. This is the degradation uh, map of the world, and we do, we, we, this is real, and we're doing it uh, ourselves. Um, and as I said, ecosystem services, I'm sorry, I've got bad news, not available with tillage agriculture. Water can't penetrate the soil after, after a few years. There's a plow pan, there's a hard concrete layer beneath, uh, and, and, uh, and so on. 
So the th reason is that the, the natural soil is a biologically live entity. You cannot create that with a mechanical implement. And that's what we're doing all the time. A productive soil is a living system, it, and, and, and its health productivity depends on managing it as a complex biological system. And there are many, many components in, in it, uh, but they all have to be managed with, with biology in mind. So an effective solution of the, to degradation is available. Minimize soil disturbance. Enhance and maintain organic matter cover so that you feed the functional bio uh, uh, the, the micro, micro, my, uh, microbes and mesofauna uh, uh, in the soil. They basically uh, do the, 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 the ecosystem functions are based on that. So, uh, and, and keep the system diversified of species. Those are the three principles, like the universal principles of human rights, these are the three principles of conservation agriculture. And they apply to any system any system from arable to horticulture to agroforestry to slash and burn to everything. And this is an, one image that if you have those three principles in the middle, then everything in the system begins to work better. Even your value chain begins to work better and your input demand are, are different. Uh, this is another image that so, uh, the conservation agriculture is the base, the foundation on which you build other things. You can't just say we need good seed genetic potential without the, the production system base itself. So on the right, we have conservation agriculture, manually uh, driven, uh, 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 animal driven uh, tractor, and this is the current situation. This is what a, a, a conservation agriculture field looks like. Stubble, mulch, uh, uh, legume coming through, uh, soil health being maintained, critical. On the left, five years after five years, you have a conservation agriculture soil, alive, Dead soil on the right. That's what we've got now in most of the world. This is conservation agriculture. It took off about 20 years ago. We now have 125 million hectares, increasing at 7 million hectares per annum. And it's now in all continents and in all agroecologies. Uh, and, and this is the way it's distributed, 50% in the north, 50% in the south. We're now making great progress in Africa and Asia. Um, Drivers are basically erosion, uh, but now global cost of production, and now demand for ecosystem services. Uh, I, and, the, and the impact is less fertilizer use, less pesticide, less machinery, 70% uh, less energy use, to, uh, you, uh, less water need. One thing which is coming through is carbon sequestration. You want more carbon in the soil, you can't do it with the current system. Use uh, uh, conservation agriculture. It'll be above the chart. Now, there is lots of documentation now here, uh, Canada, Australia, uh, Brazil, and, and also conservation uh, agriculture for small farmers, Tanzania, Lesotho, uh, Paraguay, all coming through now, and, 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 and the wider application into crop livestock integration and agroforestry. So, it is not a blueprint, it is a concept, local adaptation is required, uh, and an understanding of the concept is important for practical solutions for CA, uh, in some cases gradual approach, in other cases full. Finally, I think that we are here with a new, a new instrument which can be an answer to removing the deepest environmental footprint, and that is the soil tillage, and it is working. Thank you. At the end of the session, actually, I would like to uh, express my deep thanks to the three eminent speakers of this session uh, who left us with nearly about 10 minutes for question and answer. So we will take like four question and then each question should be given in one minute and the answer will be also one minute uh, for in response to each one of them. Anyone need to ask any question here? Please. Anyone from this side? Center? Hmm? Center? Please. Start. Rashad Hijazi, assistant professor. Behind him. Go ahead. Yeah. Your name and affiliation, please. Rashad Hijazi, assistant professor in architecture and tourism at UFS University. So uh, I have a brief comment for uh, Professor Biltagi. In 1990, we have uh, zero conservation agriculture percentage compared to the world. 2000, we have the same percentage as zero. Okay. 
So 2000, we have same percentage zero. Uh, 2012, we have same percentage zero conservation agriculture. So we can see that there is uh, work done in this field, but at the same time, we have no outcomes. Uh, the other thing is uh, related to uh, the situation of conservation agriculture. We have uh, idea about uh, what uh, Ministry of Agriculture done and Agriculture Research Center, but uh, I think there is great fail to address conservation agriculture in Egypt to the world map because we have nothing now. We only know that uh, some people working, for example, is Dr. Fauzi Karachi is here. He's, uh, he starts some work. He is leading a card office in Cairo, and he starts some partnership with Australian people to make some improvement in conservation agriculture situation. Uh, so I hope he can succeed in this. Uh, up to this moment, we have very poor extension system, and at the same time, we couldn't see any implementation such as machine, not only something we work in Egypt, just we import some types and there is no outcome. So my question also to Dr. Amir, how we can overcome this problem and where is exactly that defect we have? Thank you. Well, I think uh, uh, you have a point. We, we know that uh, conservation and agriculture is not widespread in Egypt, but uh, there, there was uh, trials of zero tillage trials of raised beds. The agro-management techniques is very important to go hand in hand with the improvement of the genetic resources. And as you can see from the results, there is no way that we, you can increase the yield and, and use your resources like water and so on better but using conservation tillage. But this needs a holistic system. It needs as well appropriate extension. And these elements need to be injected, not only the work of the benchmark sites of uh, which ECARD is doing with the Agricultural Research Center, but we need to expand this uh, to the farming communities. As far as the mechanization issue is concerned, the Institute for Mechanization in the Agricultural Research Center was created to develop machineries which will fit different agro-management techniques in Egypt, and therefore machines which will, uh, will help in forming the risk bed and so on, they have to design and they have to implement with the private sector. Thank you. So what was the problem you said? Uh, on, on what was the oh yeah well no there is a tremendous potential and, and as Dr. Al Baltagi said uh, FAO uh, did start some work uh, but it just like like uh, the curve you know the more effort we put in the more attention we pay it will take off it's just simple as that and, and, and so uh, uh, Egypt is, is, is waiting for it. And, and, and thank goodness, uh, work started during El Beltagi's days in Ikada, which is now maturing. And there, there is some very good work on conservation agriculture uh, coming out of Ikada. Uh, and, and now it's taken off in Algeria, in Morocco, in Syria, uh, in Jordan, uh, Lebanon. And of course, Kazakhstan is a, is a great success story uh, 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 with, with CA. So. Yeah, good morning. Jagdish Mitra from Bangalore, India. A great presentation on conservation agriculture. My question is to Dr. Amir Kassam. Um, the question is, uh, how do you fit in the weed management in conservation agriculture? What's your recommendation? What's FAO's recommendation? That's one question. Second question is, uh, you also mentioned about a local application, right? International development, local application. How do you go about bringing it in such a way that is easy to apply locally in different parts of the world? Do you have like a kit available, you know, easy to follow? Thank you. Yeah, uh, both very good questions. Uh, the the, the weed, weed management, like currently, it depends on, on the farm power and, 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 uh, and, the, and the production system uh, you, you're using. Uh, it, with, the small, with the small farmers, it, it, we basically say go for integrated approach. The two things which are being missed out in weed management uh, are, are that the mulch itself is a tremendous, uh, a tremendous uh, suppressor of, of weed. Secondly, many of the weeds are, are, are adapted to disturbance. So you leave the seeds inside the soil, they'd start dying. Thirdly, rotation. So the Tanzania work for 3,600 farmers over, four, over five years, they jacked up the, 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 the yield from 1.8 ton to 7 ton with no, no additional input, but the uh, weed management was totally in, through integrated weed management. 
cover crops do a great job to, to suppress, which we don't use in, in our, in our so-called modern agriculture. So cover crop, rotation, mulch, uh, uh, and, and minimum disturbance, uh, uh, and let, let, and let the, the, the microbes eat the seeds in the soil. Okay, thank you, Dr. Amir. Please. Oh, so, uh, sorry, there was another, another, another question. Yes. Yeah, uh, it, it, it varies from place to place, uh, uh, again, depending on uh, farm power. Uh, and and it, it's, uh, it's uh, we're right, we just finished a, a paper on, on institutional and policy support for upscaling. Uh, uh, and and, and uh, we are putting together a manual for, for different types of situation. But it, it's the principles are the same. Get a cropping system going, get mulch developing in situ, make sure that you move away from uh, water disturbance. And, and uh, the cropping system will vary from place to place uh, depending on what the cro crops are. But, but the principles are move away from disturbing the soil. Get the mulch going. And even if you have to bring it in initially, but start developing a, 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 an organic layer. Get the, the, the microbes back, especially the earthworm, the good termites, the spiders, the, the, all, the ants, everything. Get, get them back in the system. Good morning, my name is Margaret Karembu. I work for AISA Afri Center based in Nairobi, Kenya. I, this is my first time in BioVision and I must say I'm very, very impressed by the quality of presentations. Congratulations to the organizers. Now my question or rather a comment is about a worrying trend in, the, in Africa especially. When you go to the villages you find a lot of um, youth uh, idling in the urban centers. When you come to the cities, they are the, it's the same. And even the graduates that are coming out of our universities of agriculture, uh, bio, biotechnology, science, and so on. And I was just wondering, uh, you know, how can we integrate the youth into the agricultural value chains, given all these technologies available, and the fact that even the small-scale farmer we are advocating to empower is actually a very aging and uh, malnourished uh, population in the rural areas. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Opoff and Dr. Adil may comment on this. Uh, start with Dr. Adil. We often think that the way in which we can make agriculture attractive to young people, the next generation, is to give them higher incomes. And I agree with that. But it's not enough. People live not only by money and bread alone, but also by status, self-respect, sense of the future. Uh, what uh, Amir has been talking about and what w I would talk about for SRI, we think these are post-modern agriculture. These are the most modern agriculture. This is built upon the emerging sciences of microbiology, of soil ecology, of epigenetics, and other fields. So I would like to communicate to the young farmers in Africa that there, something about the biology which is going on, which I think they will find fascinating. If they could have heard some of the presentations yesterday, if the presentation had been prepared to educate and inform young people, young farmers, about the way in which they can capitalize upon the potentials already in the plants and the soil systems that they see, I think we can make this really exciting and attractive to them. And so I would like to see this thing, how, how do we really make agriculture a very exciting and respectable occupation, not just doing what was done by the ancestors for generations and generations. It, is, it should not be a backward occupation. It should be remunerative, but it should be more than just remunerative. It should also be something they take pride in. And I think we could do that. There's some nice films, that some done in Japan, about the life in the soil. I think anyone who looks at that will be just excited to start thinking about what's below the surface and how they as stewards of this can capitalize upon these four, their own and their communities and their countries benefit. Dr. Adil. Yes, I think um, your question from another uh, direction, which relate to the use in the village. The use in the village will leave, as you said, two urban centers, and they will get lost. But you cannot utilize them unless you, you have a new vision of modernization of the villages, unless you, you have a new vision that the villages will be a center for agribusiness and add value products. And they are trained and enable them to, to, be, part, to, to be part of this agribusiness and the different, different issues which will be there, as well as information technology, where they can help the farmers in, in big programs for linking farmers to the market 
and how to assess things, and uh, they can help as well to give information related to extension. Therefore, to empower them, you have to educate them. It's, it's a, it, it, it has to have a plus of knowledge, and, and you increase this knowledge level. The more you increase the knowledge level, you will retain more young people to agriculture, because as uh, no, Dr. Norman has said, you have to modernize agriculture there. You cannot do the same, because if you do the same, he doesn't want to be like his father and grandfather. And this is the way out. Can I, can I please, Dr. Uh, Amir also yeah, would yeah. like to comment I, on I this. Especially as you're from Kenya, uh, f last five years we've been working in Kenya, right at the, in, in the semi-arid areas. The conservation agriculture farm, farms are like oases, and they are run by farmer field school. It is no big deal to f f form uh, earthworm clubs with students, uh, teach them how, 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 uh, how biological tillage takes place. Uh, you know, do ecosystem analysis with them, fascinate them with nature and how, how they can become the custodian. So the problem has been in the last three decades that we ourselves have become so ignorant about everything. Our education system is teaching a, a rural child to go to the city and not to take care of the environment which, in which it has grown up with full of, full of potential. So we, we have a problem also with our education system. Thank you, Dr. Amir. Uh, before we leave, actually, I have myself uh, a comment I would like to, uh, to raise and have the opinion of uh, our uh, eminent speakers here. Uh, yesterday, Dr. Yang, and as well Dr. Opoff, uh, he mentioned in one of his table uh, today about the uh, numbers coming from China uh, telling us that they have reached 19 uh, tons per hectare in rice. Mm -hmm. And I have also seen in one of the table presented today in this session uh, with regard to wheat, 12.6 uh, mm -hmm. tons per hectare. Is this genetic or good agricultural practices or what? And how can we adopt such kind of, uh, of practices? Uh, also. We've been talking since yesterday about the imperative responsibility. And this is very important. This is the meaning of real sustainability for the future. Mm -hmm. But we need a system or a mechanics or an organization or whatever to show us how human being can implement such imperative responsibility towards the future. Can you comment on that? Well, specifically, I happen to know the data from the Bihar case because the State Department of Agriculture went to these fields and measured things carefully. These farmers, these five farmers who got 18, 19, and 22 tons with the hybrids and conventional management got, I think, 6.9 ton average versus 3 or 4, which is their normal one. So the hybrids made a difference from 3 or 4 to, let's say, 7. But with the management, in some cases, they got these super yields not all of them get that, but the super is when the biology gets harnessed, we're 18, 19, 22 tons. So the management is not just what the humans do, it's also what the organisms can be well. induced uh, to do. Uh, I think that this, I mean, we're starting to see things which don't fit our conventional paradigm or model, which is what I call an egocentric agriculture. It's all about us, yeah. what we do. We plan, we design, we breed, we, we fertilize, and so forth. Not proper, and this is where Amir's presentation and mine are very complementary. How do we work with the natural systems that are evolved or co-evolved through millennia? I mean, eons, really. Yeah. And, and I think that our, our agricultural interventions, I like Amir's use, I mean, you can intervene, you can succeed, it may be profitable with enough inputs, but it's not long-term profitable. And it turns out that there are some really wonderful windfalls if you can get the biology right. Yeah, thank you. Well, at the end, I would like to uh, thank all the audience. And once again, I thank our eminent speakers for the wealth of information we got from this session. Thank you very much. Thank you.